Hey, hello. Welcome to episode number 20 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choit. Uh, it's the same guy from the previous 19 episodes. Uh, as I did last episode, I'm just going to do most of my plugs and stuff uh, up front uh, right now. Just get that out of the way. Uh, my website is peoplewelovepodcast.com. Everything you need is right there. Social media and all that. Of course, there's uh, many listening options on there as well. Spotify, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, links to those. Um, so yeah, however you listen. You're listening right now, which is, which is pretty cool too. So however you're listening now, you can, you can keep listening on that. I'd also appreciate a positive review on iTunes. That's always helpful. And there's also a private Facebook group now as well where you can meet and interact with others and talk about the show, the People We Love podcast group. Uh, that's what that's called, the People We Love podcast group. Let's just get into today's show. Today's guest is actor and filmmaker James Tang. James joins me and tells me all about growing up, mostly in uh, Thailand, in quite the international community. His dad was a home theater guy and mostly really just wanted to show off his uh, sound system at home. But little did dad know that this would plant a seed that would lead James to Hollywood, ultimately. And, uh, oh, James also ran his dad's custom golf shop in Miami for a couple of years, which was an invaluable life experience for him. So we covered all, acting, golf, Thailand, family, and, um, yeah, that's about uh, all I got for my little intro here. And yeah, I know, I pretty much recited word for word my Instagram post from the other day, but uh, I think that worked for this too. What do you want from me? Anyway, let's just do this. Here's James Tang. So it's good to see you today, James good Tang. Thanks you. for uh, stopping by the studio. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, definitely. What uh, What's going on? How's your day been? Day's been solid. Um, actually came from a sort of like directing class i was an actor for a directing class uh, earlier tonight for the uh, alliance of women directors so that was really cool to kind of just be uh hopping going from acting and then talking about acting yeah you're uh you're a hustler you're running around town you're you're making moves you're doing big things trying to try it aren't we all so uh why don't you tell uh, my audience about yourself and your story where you're from and every detail since uh, birth cool yeah yeah floor is yours yeah um I am, I have a bit of a, yeah, I guess traveling around a lot. So um, I was born in Florida, Miami, Florida, um, but pretty much by, I, I've studied preschool there and then by kindergarten, I actually bounced to Thailand. Um, my dad was born in Thailand and um, I feel like, I don't actually know why exactly we went that time, but we went there and then suddenly by the second half of first grade, I was back in Florida. And then finally, the second time we went back, this was in the third grade, um, we settled back in Thailand permanently for the second half of third grade onwards. So that was because um, my mother was actually born in Korea and her mother at the time was just, you know, getting a little older and having some health issues uh, and needed some kind of taken care of. And so she was in Korea at the time and it was just closer and easier it made more sense to fly her down to Thailand and warmer. Uh, Korean winters can be pretty brutal. Um, fly her down to Thailand rather than like across the to world. To live permanently. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. To live with us rather than like across the world to Florida. Sure. Um, so yeah, I went to international school, which is why I sound pretty much American. Um, ended up going to college in Canada and Australia. And um Getting into, I st ended up basically studying film and film production and ending, that was like a two-year program in Australia. And then once I graduated, I went back to Thailand. Um, I tried to pull the Robert Rodriguez um, method where he, I guess, shot like a super low budget action film in Mexico and then came back to the States to sell it. And like that basically launched his career. But I didn't even have an action film idea, so that didn't get yeah. so hot. Yeah, that, that you didn't take that idea very far. No, yeah, it was like the, the concept of it. Yeah, the thought. Then, yeah, the yeah, thought. Yeah, but no actual direction. But within that, I, I took um, an acting class to um, improve my directing. And from that, I kind of like, I kind of fell in love with it. And I feel like it was always something I always wanted to do, but never opened myself up to it. And so 
started kind of pursuing both sides of the camera. And then because, like I mentioned previously, I didn't really have that plan. Um, my dad had a business idea to start a custom golf club store in Florida, in Orlando. And I was like, you know what? Why not? You know, I might as well go learn some business and things aren't really taking off here for me. So I went and did that. Um, but, you know, entertainment was always calling out to me. So after a couple of years, I ended up moving to LA, which is where I am now. All right. Well, that's the interview. Yeah. I appreciate your time. We got everything <laughs> we need right there. And it's been uh, it's been fun. No, why don't why don't we go? Why don't we now that I kind of know your whole story yeah. somewhat? Why don't we go way back to the beginning? Why don't you tell me what you remember even before moving to Thailand permanently mm -hmm. from third grade on? What do you remember like even before then? Do you remember moving a lot? What did it feel like to be moving at like age four, five, six, whatever it was? I feel like I mean at that do time. Do you remember that at all? A little bit in. Yeah, I feel like I, yeah, I remember roughly like always where we were and what we were doing. And like, I think at the time, because I was so young, I, it didn't occur to me like that that wasn't really exactly what everyone else did, I guess. So I just kind of went with it. Um, and I think also the fact that my parents are very used to moving around a lot and also kind of just going with it. They, I think I've read somewhere where it's just like, the kids always react to kind of how the parents react. So if the parents feel normal about it, then as a kid, you feel normal about it. So like moving was just like, oh, okay, we're moving. Cool. I, I just think whatever kids' lives are like, you know, when you're four, five, six years old, that's the, the routine. You just assume that's normal. Yeah. Whether it's good things happening in the home or unfortunately sometimes bad things happening right, at home. Sure. Like my family was looking for, they were looking to move for like a couple of years when I was about that age kindergarten first grade and we would look for houses every weekend mm -hmm. and i thought that's just what people did right, right i'm like oh this is just you know it's the weekend people look at houses that's right. that's what every family does that's what all people do so it's whatever your react you know right. your reality i guess everyone thinks is the normal the normal thing so yeah. when you got to thailand what you know did you know when you were in there and you know from third grade till through high school you said you when did you get yeah, back? graduated high school yeah and then you came back to the states and you went to college you said in canada and Australia. And Australia. Yeah. So when you were, were in Thailand in third grade, did you know that by then it was going to be more a permanent situation at that point or you, it, it wasn't definitely permanent then? I, I'm i not even sure if we if we knew, but like, because even within, within Thailand, we moved around within the community next to our school. Sure. Which like at least like three times, which was also just kind of normal. It was just like, oh, we're moving to there. Okay, cool. Like I didn't question it. And just like went along with it. Yeah. Um, I feel like if I think back on it, maybe that was, I think it would have made more sense that it would have been more permanent anyway for at least that time being. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I feel like it wasn't really like a main concern of mine at the time anyway. So when you were, you were in third, fourth grade, you were going to the international school already at that mm -hmm. point and learning English? Yeah. So how, how many, is that the only language you speak? I speak Mandarin and some Thai. Um, gotcha. Yeah, like I'd say, pretty basic levels for. But both. English has always been your first language, we would say. Technically, I learned Mandarin like when I was like an adolescent. Yeah. Um, and then English was the second language chrono chronologically that I learned, but it quickly kind of became the main language. Yeah. That I spoke. Yeah. I follow. I follow. Cool. And what about um, what about just life? Life growing up in in Thailand, and I mean. Life even was awesome. even compared to you know life that you see for teenagers and kids here in the United States, mm -hmm. what you know, what do you remember from your I elementary mean, school and yeah. middle school, whatever you know? Life life is different, and um, we we lived in a like a suburban community that was built around our school, um, so that in itself we we kind of, it was kind of gated and stuff, so it was a little insular in that sense. Sure. Um, but I think, yeah, living in Thailand, you know, living standards are definitely lower out there than here. So it's way easier to afford um, more help. So like everyone around us grew up with like maids and drivers. That was like, that was like a, like a common kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so like we, depending on the maid too, they would also kind of cook for you depending on kind of their skill level. And so yeah, it was like kind of just, you know, being raised by like by parents, but then also like 
the help and also uh we lived right next to the school so we you know just bike to school and stuff and kind of make friends like around in the community um but like like life was really good we were very privileged in that sense no yeah. they're lucky you're lucky yeah. for sure and um what about the other kids? Were they all were they international kids? Or was the international so were there yeah. kids from all over the Yeah, kids from all over the world. Um we were also kind of split in that there were downtown kids. They lived actual in Bangkok proper, which was about a thirty minute drive. Give or take. I think nowadays it's like even longer just because of traffic. It's yeah. just worse over the years. But yeah, it was like split between the downtown kids and the um the kind of our community called was called Nichita, so the Nichita kids. Um and there was a rivalry. Sometimes, not necessarily, <laughs> but there was always that kind of grass is greener. I think it was a one way, actually. Everyone in Nichita was like, oh, like, I, what was, what's it like living downtown? I wish I could go downtown. Grass more is greener, often. I gotcha. But it was, I asked downtown people later on, and they're like, no, we never wanted to live in Nichita. That, that's not, no. no Funny. It's, yeah. But yeah, I mean, every, we have people from all over the world. Like, I'm just thinking of my friends. We, yeah, Americans, um, uh, Japanese, Thai, Taiwanese, Korean, um, Chinese, Thai, local Thai um, students. You better not miss anyone. Yeah, right. Swedes, <laughs> um, Norwegians, South Africans, um, Vietnamese, Cambodian, La- Laotian. Actually, I don't know. I don't know if I had any Laotians in my grade, at least, or that I knew within my immediate vicinity. Um, yeah, but people just from all over the world. And do you, and I'm guessing you felt that this maybe you didn't even notice at the time, but that this do you feel this benefited your you oh, your yeah. culturally, just experience being in school and just living yeah. where you were, just yeah, just being around all these different It definitely different came people. more to light um after I moved away and realized that not everyone kind of grew up in this style. Not even necessarily moving away, but like, you know, I would always come to the States in the summer and I'd, I'd we'd hang out with like Asian American family friends, um, and that would be that would be like there we'd notice different. Me and my sister, I have a sister. And you're in Miami when you were in Spencer. We actually come to California, um, NorCal. You, you every visit summer. the Northern. You had family in Northern California. Family friends. Family. Fr- oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And so when you were a kid, you'd visit California. Sometimes. Yeah, we'd visit and just be like, oh, there's like a there's a difference than like kind of like just a little cultural difference. We not I wouldn't say we'd be able to like put our finger on it immediately. Yeah. But just notice that there's something just a little bit different. Um, These but, people are weird. <laughs> They're not exactly like us. Right, yeah. Those um, weirdos. But, yeah, I mean, I feel like growing up around so many different cultures, it really kind of created that norm for of just being like, oh, yeah, like, oh, that person um, is of one religion and just doesn't eat a certain type of meat or something. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, okay, like that's it cool oh that person is what was it we definitely had um yeah we had so many different like religions as well uh hindu muslim christian mormon um I'm sure yeah i'm sure there's like an atheist or agnostic did you try all of them out what's that did you try all, all of the religions out i didn't like that movie try, what's yeah. that movie where the, the the kid on the boat with the ever you know saving all the animals and he, he, he tried like every religion he's like i'm going oh. i'm trying to be i'm gonna be jewish i'm gonna be christian for the next i forget oh okay life, Wait, of, pie? life of pie yeah i think that was oh, life did of pie. Try yeah, okay. yeah i can't remember that part. <laughs> i just know early on in the movie yeah i didn't i wouldn't say i physically like literally tried that yeah. i feel like being kind of engrossed like around people like because i go to some like a friend's house and kind of seeing like, oh, this is this is their kind of like religious like tradition. Cool. I think it okay. makes people more tolerant, open minded, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. accepting all yeah. these things just to be around. Yeah, being around, around different religions, different like different races and different cultures, and just being like, oh, this is just this is people. Like, yeah. oh, they do this thing this way. Cool. Like, okay, I'll just adapt to it. And like, or there there other people. I think like some people would be like, oh, you don't have to say grace if you don't want to, or like, oh, this is just how we eat or like, like my family is Asian. So we take our shoes off. So then like going to this, um, like white American, I can't, a Christian, I think, I don't yeah. know if it was a specific sect or something family. Like, uh, this was a good friend of mine back in like the third grade where they kept their shoes on in the house. Yeah. And I was like taking my shoes off and I was like, for the first, this is the first year, like early experience of in someone's house with, uh, yeah. 
And I was like, oh, this is okay. Huh. This is a thing. Okay. Um, but I think I, I, if I remember correctly, I just kept my shoes off anyway. Cause I was like, this is kind of weird. Like it, yeah. keeping the shoes on in the house. I don't know. I'm going to, I think most of my friends were, were shoes off now that I think about it. Hmm. Think, Not all Asian, but right, right. Yes, shoes off people. Yeah, I think apparently scientifically <laughs> it's a cleaner. It's cleaner anyway. I think so. Yeah, I try to be shoes off in the house right. for sure. Yeah, you don't know when you step in. Shoes there, off right? in the street too. Oh god. <laughs> no. Okay. So when did you uh, when did you start to get into uh, the acting and, and 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 entertainment and and creative things? Yeah, that was something your father had sort of introduced you to. Or- yeah, I think growing up um, again with the privilege, my uh, dad has. I think like every house he lives in, he has space for a movie room, um, and you know it's like a projector and like big speakers and stuff. He's a he's he's a cinephile and an audiophile, and. You know, I kind of grew up around the fact that there's kind of like whenever a friend's over, he puts a movie on. Kind of just just like show off the system. Right. Well. That's what I was yeah. going to uh, yeah. guess and ask. Show off the system, the sound system, um, and, you know, the projector and like the visuals of it. Yeah, I have a father that's uh, somewhat similar, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's fun. It's cool. You, yeah. know? you get to like put on like a big action film or something just to like kind of show it off to right. like, the friends and stuff. Um, so I was always growing up around that. But I feel like I never opened myself up to it until later in life. Um, the seeds were planted. Yes, the seeds were definitely planted. Um, I don't know. I think part of it definitely is perhaps the lack of representation in Hollywood films. Um, he would have both like Hollywood films and like some Chinese films and some Thai films. But I think the majority of what we had and watched definitely were still like Hollywood films, yeah. American Hollywood films. And... Um, I think the there's there is a, there was a lack of Asian representation within it. Um, I don't know if that's the full. I wouldn't say that's the full reason for not opening myself up to it, but I think it lended to the fact. Sure, I was I was shy as as a kid as well. So I think like the notion of being an actor was never there. Um, though I do feel yeah, at some point around that time as well as a kid. There was like the kind of pipe dream of, oh, I'll, I'll be a director. This was how, how old were you around these times when you started? To... I'd say like still elementary school-ish. Gotcha. That like... So you're still, you're still pretty pretty young. Yeah, yeah gotcha. and like, you know, when people are, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I didn't know what to say. And like, I like movies, but I never would like want to... I never was open to the fact of being an actor. That yeah. I was just like, oh, yeah, I, maybe a director. And people were like, oh, okay, cool. Ha, ha, ha. You know, it was just sure. kind of like a thing. And then it was, um, it was only in college when I was actually like, you know what, why not? You know, it's an elective. It's a class I can take that's, that's available for me. Um, why don't I just try it out and just see? You have to get exposed to things before you can become passionate about them and make yeah. them, you know, yeah. your goals and whatever. Yeah. When you, you said you weren't super into movies when your, you know, your father first exposed all of his, you know, exposed all his movies to you. Mm-hmm. Were, were you, were there any sort of movies that you gravitated towards more than other particular genre? Did you, or is it just mostly just mainstream American films or, or I feel like overseas films or. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know. It just somehow the genre tended to be like, probably like action adventure and stuff. Like I remember the Goonies. I watched the Goonies a lot. Um, we had definitely Star Wars, Indiana Jones, um, Aliens was, it, it would be on once in a while, but I was kind of frightened of it as a kid. I'm uh, still frightened. Right. Actually, yeah. I mean, as a kid, it's very, very <laughs> yes. frightening. It's kind of horrifying. Um, I do remember one time where as a kid, um, pretty young, this was in Florida where my dad, where Terminator 2 had just come out. And he was he was pitching me on it because he was like your dad wanted to take my dad wanted to take the family to see it. This was a rated R film. And you were how old? You said I was like six. Yeah, I was young. Yeah, but he was like his the pitch of it is awesome because he's like, yo, this is about like a robot from the future that comes back to like protect someone. And I was like, that sounds really cool. But then I get in there and it's not a kids film. Um, so just the, the intensity of like the music and the uh, just the way the film is crafted, I I just got scared really early on, and so my parents were like, oh shit, okay, let's um, 
I don't know if you could swear on this or not. Ah, you could swear. You sw- okay. I encourage it. Okay. Swear more. Uh, my parents are like, Ooh, okay, let's let's take them out. We, I, remember, I remember we walked into the closing credits of uh, 101 Dalmatians um, in a different, just like a theater, just like the next one over. Um, yeah. So, but then now for me, Terminator 2 is one of my favorite films of all time. But uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, James Cameron, Steven Spielberg films, or at least, you know, I guess Spielberg produced um, Goonies, but that, that kind of like realm was always something that definitely I was drawn to. Yeah, I hear you. I'm still trying to figure out a way, maybe what, how can we combine Terminator and Dalmatians? Is right. there, is there an idea in there? That could be, yeah. I wonder what your dreams were like that night. You can, they were probably <laughs> like, kind of I don't want to say, place. yeah, dogs may have been harmed in, in, in those dreams. Right. Cool. So you so you started to get into into acting and directing. It sounds like in in college you took some courses that kind of like where uh, you filmmaking, got, filmmaking, directing. Yeah, yeah. And, where, um, and you said you studied in Canada. I studied. I started at UBC, uh, University of British Columbia in Canada, and yeah. So I was, you know, I did my first year. They had like a foundations course you could take to kind of just kind of like a general ed course. And I was still very kind of undecided of what I wanted to do with my life. So you weren't, you didn't like declare that you were a filmmaking major or anything at that point or, or where, where was that no. declared? Um, so the, the funny story is and how it led me to Australia was originally their film program would be, you take the first two years of kind of just general ed and just whatever you want. And then the second two years, I think you have to, I had to apply, but then the second two years would be the film program. And as soon as I started my second year, they announced, we're going to close our film program next year to restructure it. So I was like, oh, well, I can't even stay to do this film program. Yeah, it's not even an option anymore. Yeah. Um, so then I went back home for a summer and a friend of mine, I was just chatting about wanting to get into film. And a friend of mine was like, oh, actually, another mutual friend of ours is in Australia going to film school. I was like, Okay. So I looked at up the school he was going to and did some research and um, it was the weather was warmer overall than Vancouver for me. I'm from the tropics, so the warmest part of Canada was still too cold for me. Um, and then, yeah, it was a two year program, but it was still like a thorough uh, three semesters per year uh, program. So I was like, this seems like a good idea. I can still kind of finish my degree within like kind of like a reasonable amount of time, four and a half years rather than four um, and still, yes, yeah, still get a uh, bachelor's. So yeah, I ended up transferring to Australia. It's amazing. What did your, uh, what did your parents, what did your dad think of, of you pursuing films? It sounds like almost like you weren't, you were kind of had your feet wet a little bit. You were, I like it, but not sure what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But then when they took away the program from your school in, yeah. in British Columbia, yeah. is it that, oh, it's almost like that prompted you like, oh, I, this is not even an option, but now I realize that this is what I want now that I can't have it in some yeah. way. Yeah. Is that part of it? And I'm just curious what your, yeah. you know, what your dad thought about pursuing film. Were they, were your parents like, oh, you better pursue something that's, you know, more stable, more money making right. venture, or do they just think they were they were totally supportive and just like yeah, do it, let him do what he wants? The luckily, yeah, my parents are very non traditional Asian parents in that they definitely weren't pushing me towards you know um, like engineering or lawyer, doctor type. It's your problem, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> um, though, ironically, I tr- I almost like fell into that role when people were like, oh, what do you want to do in college? And I was like, I don't know, be an engineer, I guess. And like, I knew nothing about engineering. But did you get good grades? Were you academically Generally smart? pretty, yeah, no, yeah. Like I got like, at things that like I either cared about or was naturally good at, like I got a five in AP calculus. Um, but then like history, I did not care about at the time. So like, I like scraped by with a C. So it was one of those like, it was either if I was good at it, then I was naturally good at it and I didn't put too much effort into it. Or if I kind of cared about it, then I put a little bit of effort into it. So science and math were you were you were decent at it. Sounds like you can't yeah. no, you can't just you know, most people are not like, yeah, maybe maybe I'll be an engineer. You can't maybe right. I'll be an engineer unless you at least have like the intelligence or like some kind of skills or inclination in one form or another towards that. Well the thing was I didn't know anything about engineering. It was just kind of like I had heard that I just somehow got that inkling that, oh, Asians do engineering. So I was like, I guess I'll do that. And everyone, like my parents are like, okay, cool, I guess. I think that makes you a victim, but I'm not sure because engineering is not a bad, bad line of work. 
So it's not, a weird, yeah. yeah. I don't know how there were some things growing up that I just some weird notions that I lived by that I was like thinking back, I'm like why there was there's no reason for that. Um, and but to back to the question though, um, my dad is an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a businessman essentially, and so for him, it's 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 more about just can you make money and survive doing something. And so having taken a couple just like film elective classes in Canada, I was able to at least show that I could make something and that it was entertaining. And so when I did kind of say like, hey, I want to go to Australia to do like a full film program, that kind of allowed both my parents to be like, well, he's done stuff. And it was like, it made sense. It wasn't like some, it was a trash. <laughs> you, you proved you proved yourself in a yeah. sense. Like you, they they're seeing it from a you know practical business standpoint, especially yeah. your dad. So he's like, "What did you create? You ca- you created a product from nothing. There was exactly. nothing, exactly. and now you created content, yeah. and, and it's something that some people seem to like. Yeah, the market seems to enjoy this. Yeah, let's let our son pursue this. Exactly. There yeah, you go. Yeah. You proved yourself to yeah. them. That's so, good. I'm, yeah, I'm very lucky in that sense. Yeah. Okay, so tell me more about I guess Australia and 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 and, and the school there and, and yeah and the education and Australia is yeah Australia is great. Um, one funny thing about Canada and Australia is that an A is starts at like eighty. Oh, I got a. Fr- you tell me the weather's better. A's start at eighty. Yeah. And fucking oh my god. I was like it's scenic there. Yeah, I I'm did, on my way. Yeah, like the yeah the grades. I was like wait. I just have to get an 80 to get an A. This this works totally great for me. Um, metric so, system. I guess. No, I don't, yeah, I don't <laughs> it's know. I not think the maybe, metric system. Yeah, it's like a former British <laughs> yeah. education system. I don't know. Um, and it's funny, actually, but they don't call them A, B, C, D in Australia. They um, It was high distinction, distinction, credit, and pass. I see. Yeah. I, it was that was I is fifty percent passing there or what? Yeah, it's still yeah. The passing is still is fifty. No, because fast pa- pa- fasting passing in the United States is sixty five, isn't it? Most schools, oh. or am I imagining that? Or maybe you don't I'm even know sure. that. I actually don't know. Um, yeah, I was lucky that I never had to worry about that. Yeah, because you got good grades. You didn't. Yeah. you never got below an A. Never <laughs> below an eighty. <laughs> yeah, it's some once in a while. Actually, now that I think about it, I think passing might have actually been fifty because yeah. there was one time. I was in Australia, um, and I took the film program, and it was a you know from pre-production to post-production. But we also had to take a couple kind of general ed classes along the way, and one of them was IT. And I did really well in the tests leading up to the final, and I <clears throat> I wanted to go home early, and I looked at the math, and I ended up calculating that if I literally just skipped the final. Did not take it at all. Because film classes don't really have finals. Yeah. Like, what would you... Like, you made something, you're done. There weren't any finals. So this one, I was like, oh, I can literally go back home a week early and skip this test and still pass. Because I was like, I don't care about the grade because I just want to learn about film. Yeah. So it worked. There wasn't like a GPA that was affected an overall grade point. Yeah. It wasn't, it, it wasn't like that. Like, they had it, but for me as a film student and filmmaker i was like care. who's gonna look at my gpa in film school to right. see how well i do yeah i was like it's the practicality i laugh because i went to film school also so mm-hmm. looking back thinking about a gpa it, uh, that i even worried about that at all is so right. is so absurd yeah but i guess sometimes you think about these things when yeah. you're i mean i guess when you're there somehow earlier on i had gotten that notion in my mind where it's just like yeah people in the film industry aren't going to look at that degree. They're going to look at what skills you can like show you can do what you can do like in the field. So I was just like, I don't care about the grade honestly, because as long as I learn as much as I can learn and do what I do well, then yeah. So yeah. So I just went home a week early. Um, and you crunched those numbers correctly, so you did pass that course. Yeah, the way it was weighted, and like if I yeah I crushed numbers, and yeah, I passed the course. Um, if your parents hear this, they're gonna be upset that you. They, I think I told them. No, I told. Oh, them. you told them? Maybe they're, they're not gonna be yeah. upset. They're like, wow. They're laid. They're laid back. They're like, wow, he's smart. He's a smart kid. He didn't. Yeah, uh, I guess so. No extra effort. No extra exertion studying for something that's completely unnecessary. Right. It's not lazy. It's just efficient. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so Australia sounds like it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it was great. I um 
Uh, yeah, it was it was basically going from pre-production to post-production and um, picking up every aspect of the filmmaking process and um, getting an idea an idea of what every kind of role does on set or outside. Um, but it, there being there, I was like, this is this is definitely what I mm-hmm. am meant to do. Like being on set was always just so fun. You know, making these like silly state of films with basically like a camera, a tripod, maybe an actor or two, or which were basically like like classmates because we were too lazy to go try to cast or something. Sure, of course, it's easier. Um, yeah, then, put your friends in everything. Yeah, that's exactly. what I did. Yeah, this one he kind of has like some acting experience or like oh, yeah, you try to rationalize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like oh, she used to be an actress. Okay, mm-hmm. like cool. even though there's probably like a drama department and people legitimately trying to pursue these things, but you're like no. not at our school actually. Oh, yeah, see. so that kind of helped good. push in, into yeah. The, the you, so you had less of a choice. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like. Gotcha. So it sounds like you gravitated towards writing, directing, acting. Yes, correct? writing, directing was um, what I always kind of wanted to do going through it. Um, but then, yeah, so that I, I finished, I graduated, and then I went back to Thailand uh, because I still have family there, and it was just it just seemed like an easier place to. And your parents were there at there. the time. Yeah, they my were parents travel a lot, but at the time they were there. Um, and then, yeah, I, like I mentioned earlier, I took an acting class to try to improve my directing. And yeah, I was like, it was just kind of like, it was a kind of like a therapeutic moment of also opening myself up to this where in high school, I did like one play where I was like the very, like the last person to come on stage and give like a small little, like few lines. And so that was like my pretty much like in middle school, I did like a play is like I sang like the beginning of like the song at the beginning never like kind of came back so you've on. had a taste here and I had there. a taste i had a taste but i never yeah i never had like big leading roles or anything or like um fully open myself and put myself into it so then taking the acting class i was like wow like this is i feel like i could i could do all right with this and i feel like i, I, I enjoy this um did you get positive feedback in the class from your peers the teacher the instructor yeah. Yeah, I did. That's probably helpful. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah. encouraging you and telling yeah. you you're semi decent at something. Yeah. That keeps you going too, yeah, for I sure. imagine. And and yeah, booking some work as well. Um, I ended up I was like the this I don't know if you could call it the lead, but technically like I was in a children's animation where my character was This was this was when? This was in Thailand, uh, around twenty eleven. Okay, so this is after you had graduated from uh, in Australia and you yes, came yes. back in Thailand yeah. and with yeah. some family and you're already pursuing acting and taking some classes yeah. there. Yeah. Gotcha. So yeah, I was basically kind of juggling um in front of the camera and behind the camera work, um, you know, editing like uh, documentary style videos that like my friends were doing or sh- kind of shooting my own shorts. Um, and then also, yeah, pursuing a little bit of acting as well. I ended up, yeah, doing this children's animation where my character was the the name of the show flying with bird. My character was bird. So like technically I was the lead, but the way the form, the show was formatted was, it was kind of like the magic school bus, except bird would show up at the beginning of each episode kind of set the stage and be like, this is what basically what we're going after this episode. All right, kids. Bye. And he'd like send them through space and time to like a bird. No, his name was bird. Oh, it was a person. Actually a bird. Yeah. And you were the voice. I was the voice of bird. Um, because he's based off of a Thai, um, singer. He's, uh, yeah, I guess you could call it pop. He's, but his, the genre is um, of like this traditional Thai style of singing, but then he like popified it. And so he got like really famous from that. And they created like this children's animation around him as one of the main characters. Interesting. And so I voiced the English version. Um, but yeah, he'd like show up at the beginning of the episode, send these kids off to like the middle of nowhere to have them kind of like solve the, the riddle or like find like it was, they were looking for lost notes. So like find those notes. Uh, it was a music based show. And then maybe come back at the end of the episode to like save the day. So like I feel like the workload I had was actually less than the other actors. Yeah, you came in, you said that your couple lines came back at the end, said your other lines. <laughs> exactly. Was this kind of your first like on screen voice, on screen? It was no type before role? that. My first on screen role was for a feature film called Trade of Innocence. And that was a film about basically <laughs> 
honestly, it is a bit of a white savior trope. A <laughs> American couple coming to Cambodia. They film Thailand for Cambodia. Coming to Cambodia to like try to fight human trafficking and like lead the police officers, yeah. and, like like be the consultant. So this is American film that was shot in in Thailand. In Thailand, gotcha. Set, meant to be set in Cambodia. Gotcha. Oh, um, in Cambodia. Yeah. But yeah, we were in Thailand. So I was like a Cambodian police officer, police translator. Um, so I had a couple days on set, um, which was really cool. But also I was like, I am, I don't really necessarily look Cambodian. Um, I'm also six foot one. So I kind of, not everyone else in the scene was that tall. Yeah. So it was like, I was kind of like just sticking out a little bit. I was like, this is okay. What was the budget on this film? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Yeah, I don't need to. <laughs> um, so that was my first real experience on on um yeah on like a big kind of hollywood style set which was really cool because how like, many people are on the set like on, on an average day there um it was it was independently it was financed, independently financed, but, but it was still a legit big yeah fairly big yeah. set um, they were up. shooting on at the time it was red I don't remember if it was Red Ones or, or more, but it was on Reds. And at the time, Reds was like the hot hot new camera. And they had some big old lenses. And yeah, they had two cameras. They had like at least 20 crew on yeah, set. Yeah. Significant crew. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe did, 30. Did your uh, family, friends, parents ever see the that animation that you worked on or, or this film? And how did they react to uh, seeing and hearing you on the screen initially when they first the- started to... The Catch animation never came technically came out. I think it got it got picked up by um like Al Jazeera's like children animation yeah. branch, but like only for the Middle East. Yeah. So it's available for like people located in the Middle East. Oh, I'm gonna be digging later for it. You know that. Yeah. It was but like it yeah, it came out in like a weird way that the distribution wasn't like as big as it could have been. Do you have uh any footage of that? I or? do. I've been finding some clips. Yeah, that we is got it, sent. It's is it video and audio with your voice yeah yeah what does this guy look like what does the what does the animation the character look like he something about this seems very intriguing and maybe hilarious to me (laughs) he he just he kind of he looks like the the actual person bird um so yeah i don't know that guy yeah yeah (laughs) i don't know if that's not man yeah like i don't think anyone outside of thailand would really know who he is and so i'm trying to think he just he's like a we're gonna change this yeah Maybe <laughs> he's a he's a tall Asian dude with kind of like medium length hair and he he's just like kind of I don't know like a, just a kind of street fashion where he wears like a kind of hoodie over like a shirt and like a headband like other than the headband as far as I know that kind of describes you so maybe that was well I think part casted. of it too yeah like <laughs> I was like kind of okay I just like it's definitely on brand for me. And what about the movie? Did did people see the movie? The movie, I feel like it ended up on Netflix years later. And so once in a while, people would be like, hey, I, I saw you in this Trade of Innocence movie. I was like, oh, awesome, cool. Because um, it was it was a pretty small part. Yeah. Um, just like a couple lines, pretty much. Um, so they don't say you were awesome. People people just say they saw you, and then they don't follow up with, I yeah. loved it, you were great. People right. just say, I saw you. I, yeah. And? Yeah. And think, when uh, wasn't it awesome or what? Yeah. That's what you're supposed to say. Well, actually, what ended up happening was they dubbed over me. What yeah. the hell? Yeah. They dubbed over my lines. Um, I guess I didn't sound Cambodian enough. <laughs> so when well, I... They could have figured that out in advance. Yeah. I ended up... Um, for for the actual thing, I, I put on a Thai accent because um, I didn't know how to do a Cambodian accent. So I was like, okay, the closest thing I feel like I can do is maybe put a Thai accent on. Plus, like, all the actors were Thai anyway, so... Or, I mean, all the, the, the local actors were Thai. Um, they hired True Tran, who's um, actually an Asian-American, uh, Vietnamese-American, um, but he also played a Vietnamese character. Um, uh, yeah, I met him on set. He was really cool. But, yeah, like, the local cast that was hired to play Cambodian were actually, like, all Thai. So it was, like, this kind of weird situation where I was like, oh, okay. Uh, but they ended up dubbing over me, and so yeah, it's not exactly on my reel because yeah, you're <laughs> you're kind of over too with that one never aired, and then uh, yeah, yeah. and then they overdubbed you. But it sounds yeah. like it was pretty amazing experience, and we will get to things that did air and did uh, get made and produced and continued forward with uh, in that manner. Mm-hmm. So what did happen? Uh, where do we go from there with your 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 life and career and whatnot? 
pretty much. We're going to get to LA at some point. I yeah. Think. Yeah. I, I pretty much took a detour there with my career, uh, entertainment career, because it was around that time where, yeah, like I had done some stuff, but like things weren't exactly like skyrocketing or anything. Right. Um, and so that was around the time where my dad was like, hey, I've got this business idea in Florida. Do you want to, excuse me, uh, do you want to come out and do that? So I did. And so, yeah, I kind of took um, basically like a couple of years off from entertainment. Absolutely did not do any of that, um, but eventually knew I had to come back. So that was like, you know what? I'm in the States already. I have U.S. citizenship. Thank goodness. Um Every time people talk about visas, I'm just like, wow, yeah, like the, the, the headaches they have to go through. Yeah. The headaches people have to go through. So thank goodness. Um, yeah, I'm a U.S. citizen. So I was like, Hollywood is, I got to be in Hollywood. What was that? What was that business in Miami that you and your dad uh, had together? It was a on? custom, it was a club fitting business. So basically we would um, fit golf, uh, golf clubs. Uh, we, yeah. We would fit golf clubs to players. Custom, custom made golf clubs. Yeah. So most people might not know this. Um, generally in the U.S., when you buy a set of clubs, you just go to like a big box store and buy an entire set. Right. But they, the way they manufacture these things, they kind of just churn them out. So the materials, the raw materials they use for like the shaft in the entire set might not necessarily be as good quality as the, um, the stuff you get like uh, kind of third-party stuff. And the, the tolerances as well can be kind of all over the place. Like a, a club has a, a flex. The shaft of a club has a flex on You're it. You're not going to try to sell me one now, are you? No. I'll sell you the idea. Because <laughs> I can see. Did you work on the floor? I, I did everything. Yeah, I worked on the... I sold people the clubs. I fit them. I did the actual fitting. I did the building of the clubs. We had a workshop. Um, right on site, everything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, kind of, yeah, managed the funds and stuff. Uh, designed advertisements. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did the copywriting and created like brochures. I mean, this sounds like you probably learned or even continued to develop a lot of useful skills. Yeah. Even though you were not necessarily acting. But if you're working on the floor, that's really, yeah, that's performance in a sense. That's business. That's everything. That's a lot of, a lot of crossover there. Yeah. yeah, Technically, dealing with the public has value. Yeah. Because you're going to get all kinds of people and you get all kinds of experience. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, I've I've been able to avoid quite a bit of that in my life, but some of it. (laughs) I've had some jobs where I interacted with the public over the years, for sure. Yeah, and it's most of the pe- most of the time, most people are great and they're fine. But it's there's one or two that just like they are they are really good at ruining your day, really good at that. So because their lives are probably ruined, yeah, or they're just having a bad day. I guess that's yeah. possible too. Yeah, but the taking it out on uh, customer services, I don't think ever a productive thing. No. Um, but yeah, luckily, I can't say I ever had to deal with like nightmare customers, which was very good. Um, cool. What, and so you were at this golf, uh, making custom golf clubs, doing everything in your dad's business for a couple of years. What, mm-hmm. And what happened with the, that business ultimately? And the business you, still exists. So anyone that's interested in getting custom fit, if they're in Orlando, go to Jesse James Golf. I love it. Um, yeah, we ended up... Um, uh, selling the business to someone who was working for us at the time, and he's taken over and he's doing great with it. Oh, I gotcha. I was gonna say like we don't need to promote them if we're not, uh, you know, we don't need to help to help a stranger. But it seems like someone that you're, in, you're yeah, no, you're he's he's good a standing with a yeah, good yeah, friend. Yeah, he's a he's a lovely person. You and make lefty clubs or what? If they're custom, you can must be able to make lefty. Yes, lefty. That's the str- the really interesting thing about um, lefties in golf is, I think, the statistically. It, they, there's only like 10% lefty golf clubs. It's much less. I'm surprised it's that high. Right. Yeah. It's it's a very it's a very low number. Um, though apparently in Canada, because hockey is a popular sport, and that there are more lefties that end up in hockey. Right. Far more lefty. Yeah. Hockey there's sticks. there's more lefty like friendly clubs in in Canada because um, I get I don't know. In, like, but you know what you guys don't have in Canada courses. Be- yeah right yeah because it's All the, the weather is terrible yeah. for 90 percent of the year yeah so you do have courses but, but they're probably covered in snow. snow for a lot of did yeah. you did you play golf uh, as a kid did you, your dad play i did yeah my my got- family yeah my dad i think he got into it like either right when i was born or yeah around the time i was like a toddler he got into it and like like became obsessed with it yeah how come you're not tiger woods um i couldn't 
cut the mental game of it. Really? Yeah. And what, played, what does that mean? It means um, I growing up, I guess I I was a very much a perfectionist, and so if I hit the ball badly, I got very very angry. But also, I guess I never knew why. Um, if like I got it hit, you know, like a banana slice or something, I never knew why that happened. Um, I guess no one really could tell me exactly why that happened and how I could do the fix. And that could be frustrating. Yeah. That's very frustrating. Yeah. And so I feel like I didn't love the sport enough to want to just try to figure that out for myself. And so eventually I kind of, I was the one that kind of like let it go and quit. Um, but my sister was actually a professional golfer. She was a pro with it. Yeah. Damn. Um, she, she took that and is going as far as you can with it. Um, keep an eye out on Jesse Tang, Jesse with a Y. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I kind of let that go. What did your, what did your dad think when you, and your parents think when you quit golf? Were they, were they set? Was your dad sad? Did he have big dreams for you? I feel like they were, yeah, they were definitely disappointed. Maybe really? not necessarily in bit. the, in the, um, big dreams, the way. tournament aspect of the professional aspect of it, but just the fact that like, I, you know, recreationally, it's something that we can kind of all do together. So I also, you know, once in a while can play together. But yeah, it was a kind of disappointing that I couldn't like, I guess, pursue it. You join with them at least. Yeah, it's like I play on the weekends or something. Yeah, you don't, you didn't, you, you play once in a while, but you don't love it even enough to just do it often. It's like you're kind of, yeah. yeah. What about someday. the driving range? We got to go to the driving range. Someday, yeah, yeah. That's, someday. That, that works. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about how you got a, got to uh, L.A. Mm-hmm. after the... Uh, the golf uh, world. Yeah. So, yeah, I was luckily very able, very lucky to transition out and move to L.A. And basically came out here knowing, you know, a, a handful of friends, but essentially kind of not knowing what I was doing coming out. No one does. Right. Very few. Yeah. So I came out to write and direct because just coming back to that notion of Oh, I'm not an actor. Where I was, I was just like, oh, I was, you know, I was an actor in Thailand, but I don't know if I can cut it in Hollywood. You know, I don't know. There's, they're not. I don't know if they're looking for Asian actors or anything. So, I came specifically just to write and direct. And then after like eight to ten months, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to get on set. I don't know how to meet more people and do more work. So, I guess I might as well open myself back up to acting as just a potential a potential venue of just getting on set sure you know and the day i basically i had gone back to thailand for a 10-year high school reunion and then the day i came back i ended up getting onto like a student thesis film as background so i was like okay that's i think that's a good sign it's a good sign it's something yeah um, it, yeah, it was, it was, and it was paid too. It was very surprising. Yeah. Um, things haven't exactly been that smooth since, but getting, yeah, like a paid background gig immediately after landing, like in LA, basically, I was still jet lagged. Um, that was a really good sign. So yeah, from then on, I decided to basically, um, put it at the forefront of what I was pursuing and let the writing and directing kind of sit, take the backseat. Sure. Um, that was about... Almost a full four years ago, and yeah, it's been it's been like it's been a trip, you know. I'm very grateful. Um, definitely, you know, jumping into classes and stuff. But I think because of having kind of the the background of owning a small business, essentially, um, I definitely have been also working on the business side of things and trying to figure out how to navigate that world. You had to sell yourself and promote yourself and yeah. not get ripped off and oh. use your time wisely and resources wisely. Yeah, yeah. And did you learn a lot of that from, you know, watching your dad in the in the store as well? Or did you learn what not to do from him? <laughs> well, actually, when the store opened, it was all me. So he helped open it in that he would, uh, because he has a lot of business experience, he would be like, um, you know, do things this way, do things that way. But he he had other things to do in Asia as well. So it was essentially like me, and also when my mom was in town, she would help out as well. But it was pretty much me and like one other employee. Wow! For, yeah, for like a good amount of time. Um, That's a and you didn't and you're a young man. You didn't uh, view that or feel like that was too much to take on. It was just 
It seems like you just roll with whatever. You're just, it seems like you're a very laid back dude. You're like, oh, I'm going to work in a golf store and be a business person. That's fine. I'm going to gonna move from country to country to us yeah. to thailand it's uh, it's fine whatever we'll move around <laughs> yeah you i just mean, roll with it yeah i have to like give so much credit to my parents for that because that is how they kind of live life they just roll with it like oh there's a business opportunity over here let's let's go and then they'll just go and like chase that or like yeah work on that and then like if that's no longer the main like priority then they'll kind of switch off and do something else do you f- and it seems like, you know, when you, you kind of have that sort of organic instinct and organic drive in you almost where it's like, all right, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going to be open to acting. Oh, I love acting. So I'm going to put that at the forefront of what I'm doing. Do you, mm-hmm. you, it seems like you kind of like trust your your instincts and maybe you even get that some of that from your parents almost. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Definitely like what I feel strongly. Is, yeah, strongly about it. I feel like is truthful. Um that I feel like I I do put to the forefront. Um, And yeah, I kind of, you know, having, getting into acting and really kind of taking that seriously and pursuing it and opening myself up more and more to it. It's at this point now, almost like, almost like it's, it's uh, like my mission. Cause I feel like the time is ripe for Asian representation. And I feel like if I can do well at it and, um, help with the representation then like that's like a bigger goal i feel like that's beyond just like trying to like just get famous or yeah something. no it can be more than one thing that drives you for yeah. sure it doesn't have to be one thing yeah. that's 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 cool what about uh so what about some of the highlights in the last two three four years as far as yeah as far as acting you know mm-hmm either roles that you have been your favorite roles mm-hmm. or experiences meeting people or crazy set stories like yeah just uh sure. any anything that jumps out on you from your your journey in the last few years yeah I'm curious about one of my definitely one of my favorite roles thus far and um just greatest experiences was on a film called you and me um it recently came out on video on demand uh so anyone that wants to take a look i definitely highly recommend that but it is about a it's about a deaf woman who meets a recently blinded man, and it's a rom com between them. And I play a fling she has partway through the film. And she's blind or she's deaf. She's deaf. She's deaf. Yeah. So she could see you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't want to. But she can't. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to figure out the whole logistics of all this in my head. Right. <laughs> I, yeah, I got you. Okay, yeah. go on. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So she's deaf. Um. And so I think the fact that I was the, and the, basically the role was kind of this, like, like in that world, like I sort of like a kind of lower level celebrity and everyone's like, Oh my God, he's so hot. He's so hot kind of situation. So that was really flattering to me that like a friend of mine um, recommended me for the role and that I did a Skype audition basically and um, got it. And the director like the director, I love the director. He loves me and the fact that he was um, willing to cast me in this. And it was just, it was fun to play, you know, um, it was just, you know, playing a very you know, charming guy. Yeah. It, was, it was a very fun and entertaining um, role to play. And the, actually the director's wife is the lead actress. Um, and the fact that, the fact that she is deaf and they um they brought in a lot of people from the deaf community to either translate or just be in the film. I thought that was really wonderful. Um, it adds authenticity, I'm sure, yeah, as well. Yeah, it <laughs> adds auth- authenticity. It was very inclusive. Um, people on set, um, it was just a very inclusive set as well. I'm sure they're just, there's just insights coming from all over the place that just you're just not going to get from yeah. people who just don't have that life experience just yeah. having that life experience right? i'm exactly. sure helped the film yeah in just so many different ways yeah and i think it's you know the film itself being made i think is wonderful in that it's yeah it's, it just humanizes everyone is human you know and it's like it doesn't matter what we're born with or where we come from or how we grew up and stuff it's in the end we are all human and i think the more stuff like this is put out then the more we can really understand that like sure. on a subconscious level what um this was shot in L- in LA or? yes 
And this was, what was then one more time. What was the name of the movie? And you and me. Is it? Is it? How do I? How do I find this? It is available on I think like all streaming or not streaming, but like video on demand services. Cool. So like iTunes, Amazon. Gotcha. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think if you just Google like you and me movie, it'll probably be should be like the first first result. That what was out. the reaction that some of your friends and your dad and your family thought? You know, I'm assuming a lot of them have seen this. Actually, no, I don't think so. Um. It was filmed almost three years ago now, but it only recently came out. Well, yeah, well, everything takes a million years to yeah, to get yeah. um, go through a post and yeah. production and distribution. I, Everything's a phase. I don't know if um, anyone I know has seen it. I I I have a sex scene in it. In it. Whoa, uh, yeah. So now people are going to, yeah, I don't and that's also that. going in the description. <laughs> people are going to see it now. I don't know if I. I don't know. Like if people are willing to, cool. Um, yeah. It's it's a little awkward for me, I guess, because... <laughs> I see what's going on here. I see why you haven't been promoting it um, f- uh, with your fullest uh, energies. <laughs> gotcha. Um, what is what, are, what what is like the biggest, besides, you know, obviously landing the fucking amazing, super amazing roles and making millions of dollars, what are some of the biggest challenges that you find with, with acting? I, I mean, I guess you know making lots of millions of dollars becoming celebrity and obviously you know asian representation or lack yeah. thereof in the, in hollywood is an issue but that would be nice just, too just in terms of <laughs> the, the nuts and bolts either whether it's dealing with other actors or a director or a script what do you mm-hmm. find find most challenging well funnily enough speaking of money um i feel like one of the challenges is kind of dealing with the idealism of the fact that like once you make it you're gonna make so much money or even if you book like some TV roles or something, you're going to make so much money. And the reality of it is that it's not that much to start with. You know, once you start getting up higher and higher in the, the sizes of roles and like your kind of star power, like to, to call it something, that's when things start looking good. But like when as actors starting out, it is, it is really rough money wise. Like it's one thing I definitely learned was like, you have to have a survival job. You know, it's um, being able to kind of stay afloat and stay alive, I think, is super, super important. And I mean, all the rates for SAG-AFTRA roles are on their website. So getting familiar with that, I feel, is very important for actors just starting out uh, to just get a, like a, a realistic picture of what um, what you're in for. <laughs> yeah, what you're in for. Yeah. Um, but... That aside, which the kind of depressing section of it all aside, um, I mean, it is, yeah, I feel like it is about, it is it is a big, a mixture of both the craft and the business. You know, be, definitely work working on one's craft is very important. I feel like from through artistic expression for oneself as well, um, but also being able to, you know, just have, just to, to play a character that someone envisioned so well that they they themselves are like in awe that's a great feeling and also being able to to um to bring that to life and and work with other artists yeah also really they're all everything's a challenge yeah and i think it's um it's it's really cool to be able to do that but then also it's the networking of it you know like going out there and meeting people and being driven by the fact that we want to make cool art i think is a very good um good drive but yeah i mean people are people it doesn't matter if they're actors filmmakers or not even in the industry so i think knowing how to navigate people is very important because yeah there there are horror stories that are true of like just nightmare directors or something or just people being just just abusive yeah they're like like acting teachers that can be abusive for the sake of being abusive i I don't think it has to be that way i don't think things should be that way no matter what your role or position is or how high or how low you are in this business for me i'm just trying you know you know to be reasonably nice to everyone and not burn any bridges yeah not just because you know you never know who's going to be your boss someday or in Mm -hmm. a position that they could help you just you know because it's kind of the right thing to do yeah (laughs) i think there's also (laughs) there's that yeah yeah, exactly. The being being a good person Decent. for the sake of being a good yeah. person. Yeah. There's also, um, uh, I think some challenges to overcome as well are the myths of the industry. Because the what was that? The myths. Yeah. In that like, there's the whole like the myth of like the blacklist of like 
not not the blacklist where like the script goes up yeah yeah not that one the blacklist in that like once you like screw up on set then like you'll never work in this town again kind of people just like to say that phrase yeah it's like this weird power trip that has somehow become part of i guess the mythology of hollywood um because there's so many people that work in this town that all have never heard of like other people that work in this town and so like how is it even possible for someone to never work in this town again if they mess up on set um obviously still you know do good and be a good person like we mentioned before but i'd say don't uh, people shouldn't let that be like a, a fearful thing instilled in them they shouldn't let someone else try to hold that over there right it's, it's just an abuse of power i gotcha yeah cool good good stuff <laughs> so what about any other uh notable experiences you've had on uh sets or notable roles you've, you've been in that you would like to to tell us how we can watch or yeah and then we could just get into right you know what you're working on now and sure, and how people sure. can find you so i'll kind of uh the most recent thing would do be your thing. on brooklyn 99 um i just had an episode of brooklyn 99 come out it is uh season six episode 14 the title is ticking clocks um i am a lobby cop that you it's it's a really quick little quick appearance but it's uh, you're there it's i'm there and it's fun the episode itself is great uh, Sean Austin is actually in it. Nice. Samwise Gamgee himself. Um, or actually, speaking of the Goonies, I forget, Mike, I think his name was Mike in the Goonies. I think it was Mike yeah. in the Goonies, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a very fun Mikey. episode. Mikey. Mikey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Mikey. Mikey. Yeah. It's a very fun episode in and of itself. Um, so I think in U.S., uh, people based in the U.S. can actually watch that on the NBC website for nice. at least like another month or two. Cool. So definitely catch me on that. Anything else coming down the pike for you? Um, coming down the pipe, I... Pike? Was... Is it pike or pipe? I think it's pipe. Is it pipe? Yeah. Have I been saying... I think... You know what? I think I Google this. Either one are acceptable. Pipe. Because things could come down a pipe, but mm-hmm. like come down the turnpike. Maybe that's where it came. Oh. I think I remember... Um, turnpike. Okay. I think I'm, I'm having a, a deja vu flashback, something or other. Okay. Anyway, that's not really particularly important <laughs> right now. I'll let you continue. Um, yes. So I... I recently a few things. Um, one is a web series called Black Girl in a Big Dress. That is a brilliant, awesome, awesome web series uh, created by my friend Adria Walden. Uh, season one is available on YouTube. You can binge that within like thirty minutes. It's a quick binge and it's amazing. And I am in season two. The release date is uncertain at the moment, but uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, I'd say just you know subscribe to it on YouTube or look for it on Twitter, and once she announces it, nice, it'll be out. Um, I also recently picture locked on a short film that I wrote and acted in, um, and that will be available on the Studio ADI YouTube channel once it's out. Hopefully within a month or so. Oh, that's soon! Awesome. Yeah, it's very very exciting. Uh, I'm really happy with it. I'm really proud of it. Um, the title is Batfished. And the log line is, what if vampires found their victims through dating apps? <laughs> Coming soon. Yeah. So that'll be, keep an eye out for that. That should be out. Yeah. Hopefully within a month, um, you know, post, you never really know when something's going to be out. Sure. Um, but yeah, it should be, yeah. Our, Start the buzz now. Yeah, exactly. Start keep an eye out. Now. Keep an eye out. I'll definitely be spamming that all on all my internet social media channels. Awesome. It sounds like you're working hard, working on many projects, Doing got many, many, many irons in the fire. How can so how can people find you, follow you on social media and all that? Yep. My handle for basically everything uh is James the Tang. That's uh T A N G. The is the article, the and James is James. They got it. Standard, yeah. James the Tang. Yeah, James the Tang. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I've been tweeting more lately, so you can find me um, spewing nonsense on Twitter, um, putting up pictures once in a while on Instagram, and I need to figure out how exactly to do my Facebook page, but... Yeah, those are the baby three. steps. Baby yeah, steps, baby one steps. thing at a time. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you for stopping by the studio. Thank I appreciate so your time. Me. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And it's been it's been cool. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Let's talk soon. Yeah. So there you go. My interview with James Tang. 
I don't know whether to visit Thailand now or uh, just go get me some lefty golf clubs. But either way, I definitely enjoy talking to James and hearing all about his life and his family. And I'm just continuing to be truly inspired by my guests week after week. I really love uh, everyone's passion. Uh, that shit is cool. Anyway, just uh, go to peoplewelovepodcast.com for everything you need. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, I think that's about all I got for today. It's been uh, real. Talk soon. Peace. Peace.